Welcome to Parenting Successful Teens. I'm Allie Irwin, and I'm here to remind you that you are already a great mom. I know that parenting teens is hard, but it doesn't have to be this hard. Listen in, and I'll teach you how to feel confident that you can handle whatever parenthood throws at you, and even make it fun. (laughs) Yes, fun. I love this phase of life, and you can too. Author Melissa Tears says, memory is a creative process. And when I first read that, I was both charmed by that idea and freaked out a little bit. And today we're going to talk about why the charm and why the freak out. What we think about memory is mostly wrong, what we think we know about how our memory works and how reliable it is. We Imagine we've got this camera in our minds that takes pictures or videos of what's happening. And then we want, when we want to remember something, we just scroll back through our pictures, back to that memory, and we look at it. And that's how we remember things. And some kids do have that kind of memory. I raised my daughter during the Cam Jansen book era. I'm not sure if your kids are the same age as mine, if they read the Cam Jansen books, but she was like a young teen detective and she would take pictures of something with her brain and then be able to look at that picture later and solve the mystery. That kind of memory actually does exist. It's called an eidetic memory, which is a form of photographic memory. Between 2 and 15% of kids have that kind of memory. Yay for them. Like, I would love to have that. (laughs) But even for those lucky kids, it goes away when they get older. And adults don't have that kind of memory. That's not how even people with really good memories, that's not how their memories work. Even like memory champions or, you know, people who accomplish amazing feats of memory, they're not actually using a photographic memory. They're using memory techniques. So you don't have a photographic memory. And I know you know that. But to a large extent, it still feels like our memories are very reliable, especially for emotionally charged events. But they aren't. Actually, the emotion piece of the memory is very reliable, but the details of what happened aren't. For example, we remember being mad, but we don't remember the details on what was said or even who was there. I, I laugh thinking about this because I remember my mom telling this long story one Christmas. My whole family used to gather at my mom and dad's house, and... <laughs> I remember my mom telling this long story about something that had happened that was my fault. And as she told the story, I I know I wasn't even there when that thing happened. Like, I believe her that that thing happened, but it, it wasn't me. <laughs> and now that I understand how memory works, I can see, okay, what happened... <laughs> Uh, what happened is there was a toaster oven fire and she was telling the story of how I had set her toaster oven on fire before. And while I was involved in like the 2016 toaster oven fire, that memory, you know, that's an emotionally charged event when you put something in the toaster oven and it catches fire. The emotion from that event me being tied to that event in 2016 made her think that I was also tied to that event a couple of years prior. And I know for a fact that I wasn't even there that year. And as I learned about memory, that example came back up because it's a perfect description of how malleable, how changeable our memories are. And How this works is every time we remember something, it's like we're opening the mental picture or video of that event in our mental Photoshop. 
And because we're feeling whatever we're feeling on that day, my mom was feeling, you know, very excited (laughs) about me catching her toaster oven on fire. And that excitement gets stored with the photo that we brought up, just as if we pulled a photo up, you know, taken from a vacation in the past and like applied one of the new filters to that memory and then hit save. Or another way that happens is if someone asks a question, that question primes us to look for or even create certain details in the photo we bring up. So there was a study that there was a study on this where they showed study participants video of a car crash. And half of the participants, they asked, how fast was the car going when it smashed into the other car? And then the second half, they asked people, how fast was that car going when it bumped into the other car? Okay, so everyone saw the same video. And then when they had to recall the speed of the vehicle that that hit the other vehicle, changing the word from smashed to bumped change the participants average speed. The people who were asked how fast the car was going when it smashed reported much higher speeds. So that's an example of how the circumstances after watching the movie primed people to think about what they remembered seeing differently. Memory changes based on what's happening right at the time the person does the remembering rather than the time that the event took place. It's as if every time we remember something, we reprocess it and then restore it with new information added or different information added. So why does this matter to you? I have four reasons. The first is knowing that you are rewriting your memories all the time, especially based on your mental filters and the, the situation priming you to think certain things, changes how you see events. So if you're primed to believe that teenagers are lazy or irresponsible or jerks, you will take that information and store it with a memory of the last time you asked your kid for help whether they were a jerk or not. (laughs) Like that just gets added in. And that's where we come up with the believable yet false idea that they never help, or they always get upset, or they get nervous before a big test, when the truth is probably something closer to sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they get nervous before a big exam. Sometimes they're totally fine. Okay. But our memory, you know, based on how we're priming that filter we're applying, looks for all the evidence that's part of what they talk about with confirmation confirmation bias is that memory gets colored by what we're thinking, what we're primed to think. And so we notice all the things that confirm that memory, and then we discount all the things that don't. Okay, so that's good to watch out for. Because like I said, that's where we get in those traps saying that they always do this, or they never do that. Okay, that language isn't helpful. And it's not helpful because it's not true. Number two, know that even for the super good stuff, Know that the way we have memories and the way that they're malleable is true even for the super good stuff. And just choose to enjoy that. I think that's super cool. Like we aren't totally dependent on the circumstances to enjoy our memories. We can enjoy the feeling of them and the rough details of them without needing them to be 100% accurate. And An example of this is every time I remember the great family vacation we had and just kind of let the hard parts of that trip, I can just let that fade. It's not useful information. I don't need to remember that part. 
I can just enjoy the parts that I did enjoy and let those memories get stronger. Number three, having an understanding of how our memory works helps us not take differing accounts of what happened personally. So if your kids don't remember all the amazing things that you did for them, don't take it personally, okay? Their memories are malleable, malleable, and so are yours. <laughs> and so when you know that they're not purposely trying to hurt you by believing, <laughs> you know, that like only dad showed up for this event when you both were there, if you can remember you know, that their memories are inaccurate, (laughs) then you cannot take it personally. I'm going to give you an example. So I saw a therapist a bunch of years ago, probably at this point, like a very long time ago, maybe 20 years ago. And, but the story always stuck with me that she was telling me that her daughter has all these memories from going to daycare full time which her daughter absolutely did not do. (laughs) She remembers very clearly that her daughter only went two days a week because it was very difficult for her to manage her caseload, but it was important for her that she was home, you know, most of the time. And her daughter has taken the memories of what actually happened and changed them into something else. And This malleable piece is the piece that I've had to do some work on for myself. My kids, in my opinion, in my memory, had the most amazing childhood. (laughs) Truly, I, I call it the Cadillac of childhoods. But then my oldest and I had a lot of conflict during his teen years. And when I learned this memory science... I had to do a lot of work on my fear that his memories, the memories that he remembers from his childhood, those teen years are coloring those memories, coloring what he remembers about his upbringing. And what I came to make peace with is that it does. Of course it does. And the reason I have this worry is because I know it affects my memories too. But here's where I got to, and this is, I think, the cool part, is so does all the interactions that we've had since then. Through the process of doing all the work to make peace with us, I learned that I wasn't powerless in the face of his memories. I'm not dependent on him to remember his wonderful childhood accurately in order for me to get credit for being a great mom. (laughs) I can remember what I want to from all of those wonderful 18 years of living under the same roof, and so can he. And those memories that we both have of those years will continue to change over time. And a great example of this, and this was a big part of me coming to accept this, is I realized that that's how I healed my relationship with my own mom, is on purpose, I chose to remember feeling loved. And when I had the memories of feeling unwanted, I I don't resist them, but I restore those memories by adding in love for myself now. So if I get a stab of a memory of feeling unwanted, which is totally fair because my mom was super done having kids when I came along, I don't have to resist that memory. It's not as painful for me because I can add in all the love that I have for myself now into that memory and that softens the memory. And I can add in the compassion I have for my mom. And again, that softens and heals the memory. So that brings me to number four, which is purposeful memory reconsolidation, which is the process of bringing a memory up on purpose and adding in new information. That's how we can take advantage of the malleability of memories 
to heal old wounds. Like that sounds really good, right? You don't want to carry that stuff around with you your whole life and you don't have to. So this is something that we can do on purpose. And it's actually part of what I do with my clients. Because having that mental freedom to choose what you remember is amazing. And it's honestly, it's the underpinning of learning and healing. And I want you to know that it's available to you. And this isn't whitewashing and pretending everything was fine and nothing bad happened. That is not what I'm talking about here. It's about, I want to be clear about that. It's about bringing your current level of self to the part of you that didn't get what you needed at the time that event happened. It's healing and freeing. It's not about suppressing emotion or suppressing memories or pretending that bad things didn't happen. You can acknowledge all of that and give that version of yourself compassion and love and healing from your current version. And if this sounds interesting and you would like help doing that, we should talk. This is powerful, powerful work that will help you build a strong relationship with yourself as you take ownership of your ability to create good memories and let go of what you'd like to let go of. And this is especially powerful for moms who feel like they have a lot of anger and frustration about things that have happened. And I know that that's actually, you know, there are a lot of moms that feel that way. So what I'm hoping you take away from today's podcast is just the idea that you can take ownership of your memories. And doing so means taking ownership of the lens through which you see the world and your family and yourself. Okay, before I go, I'm offering a special bonus this week. So if you are listening to this before February 3rd, 2023, and you do one of the following three things, you can get a free 30-minute coaching session with me. I am, it's a big push at the start of the year. (laughs) I'm taking a new class in super jazz. This is the class where I learned the memory reconsolidation. So if you want to play with that, here is how you get it. Thing one is you can leave me a five-star review On Apple, it's super easy, and I don't think it's a thing on Spotify, and I actually don't know how Google works. So (laughs) if you have um, an Android phone, you're going to have to look this up. But on Apple, you just click the five stars below the show description, and you're done. And then send me a screenshot of that rating to Allie at AllieIrwin.com, and I will send you a scheduling link. And I assume it's that easy on Android phones, too. I just don't know because I don't have one. Okay, the second thing you can do is leave me a review. Same deal, a couple of sentences, even one sentence saying what you find helpful or entertaining or whatever it is you like about this show or why someone else might want to listen. So either say what you like or make a recommendation of why someone else might like the show. Okay, send it to take a screenshot and send it to Allie at AllieIrwin.com. Same thing, I'll send you the scheduling link. And then thing three is to join my Patreon community. I got my first Patreon subscriber last week and I was super excited. You know who you are and I'm so incredibly grateful for you. I was over the moon. Um, So if you are interested in doing that, go to patreon.com forward slash Allie Irwin. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Allie Irwin. And you can click a button at which level you'd like to support the show at. And then I'll get a notification automatically and send you the link along with my undying gratitude. (laughs) I seriously was so excited. Moms, just like you are the reason that I record these episodes every week. Well, every (laughs) weekish. Thank you so much. 
Have a wonderful week, everyone.